Hello and welcome to part nine of the Mama You're Not Broken audiobook, written and read by me, Anna Cusack. Grief, nothing like raising kids to rip the proverbial scab off every wound you've ever had. Grief is unavoidable and inextricable from the experience of motherhood. This chapter explores the places it can spring up and why its intensity might take you by surprise. Consider yourself warned that this episode requires all the trigger warnings you can think of. Please go gently with yourself, talk with those close to you, and remember Lifeline is available at 13 11 14 if you need immediate support. Before we start this chapter, I just want to remind you that you can order a physical copy of this book and also see a full reference list at www.annacusack.com.au slash book. You can also head to www.annacusack.com.au to check out the ways we can work together. I offer mentoring via video call, voice messaging support for all things preparing for motherhood, motherhood itself and parenting and host a women's circle, writing workshop or similar special event online each month. When lockdowns are done and dusted for good, I hope to take my work on the road, collaborating with some wonderful women and individuals along the east coast of Australia. So do watch this space. If you love my content here or on social media, I invite you to give back to this podcast by becoming a patron of the show for $5 a month. Again, head to www.annacusack.com dot com dot au slash podcast to get involved let's get started chapter eight grief there is a famous yet unconfirmed story that says at a boozy new york lunch in the 1920s author ernest hemingway challenged his author pals to write a complete story in six words the criteria to take the reader on a journey with a beginning, a middle, and an end, one that made them feel something. At the completion of the challenge, so the story goes, he blew them out of the water. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. While the actual authorship of this flash fiction story is hotly contested, this tale strikes to the heart. It also demonstrates the way in which some words and phrases just shouldn't go together. Pediatric palliative care unit is one of those combinations. Another is born sleeping. Another is survived by their mother. Erin's daughter Beth died at the age of 11 from cancer. Among the condolences, Erin was on the receiving end of five horrendously inappropriate words that would send any reasonable human in the midst of their loss into a a Wizard of Oz strength, house-lifting, witch-crushing hurricane of rage. She's in a better place. No, Erin wanted to scream. She should be here with me. I know two women who, after healthy full-term pregnancies, have birthed stillborn babies. Thinking of the empty nurseries, memento boxes, and family photos of parents cradling their perfect, plump, purple-lipped babies brings tears to my eyes. The ongoing silence and lack of tact around stillbirth and child loss, an eventuality that in some cases is totally preventable, can make sharing a hard experience even harder. The loss of a baby is not an appropriate occasion to trot out the old, everything happens for a reason line, but it does slip out more often than you'd expect. While some parents may, in retrospect, feel like they were chosen to learn about the precariousness and preciousness of life through the death of their child, this is an unfair assumption to put upon a mother living out her worst nightmare. For a generation who have grown up belting lyrics from The Lion King's The Circle of Life, grief in all its convoluted forms is a concept that is rarely brought to the modern parenting chat table. When it is thrust in front of us by something as seemingly nonsensical as the death of a child, there are few who know how to simply be with those who are grieving, let alone know how to be the one who is bereaved. Author Ellie Wright, whose baby Teddy died at three days old, describes the enormous difference it makes when someone learns of the loss of her son and responds, I'm so sorry, what was his name? Rather than giving hollow reassurance. 
As simple as this sounds to offer, the recognition of loss, whether at the time of the event, subsequent birthdays, special occasions, or should have been first days of school, seems to be missing from our society's emotional toolkit. Motherhood and grief are inextricably, unavoidably linked. The aim of this chapter is not to go so far as to promise any semblance of immediate healing, but to acknowledge some of the directions from which grief can come to be part of our experiences of motherhood. In my early 20s, I was told that I may never have biological children. I went through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's original five stages of grieving in textbook form. First, I denied this possibility and stuck my head in the sand about my fertility. Then I got angry at every person I saw who I perceived to be a ne neglectful or a lesser parent than I would be. I tried bargaining. Universe, if you grant me a baby, I will shower it with more love than any child has ever known. Any mother who has experienced infertility, then gone on to have a child, will know of the impossible deals they make with their God and how fruitless and guilt-inducing these promises will later become. As years ticked on, I became resigned to my childless state. My aim became to make a good enough life rather than the one I had dreamed of. I skipped back and forth a bit, but eventually got to the stage of acceptance, where I still felt loss, but began to reconnect with the other sources of supreme joy in my life. I felt that I could live a full life, with or without children in it. I shook and cried when I truly came to believe a satisfying, meaningful life was possible for me, instead of being told it by someone else or thinking it with my rational mind. After trying countless treatments, Six years of emotional processing and within a month of my acceptance revelation, I was pregnant. As beautiful as the process of surrendering to whatever may come can be, it is an unlikely scenario in reference to grief and loss in motherhood. While it is possible for a baby to come to life, it is not possible to bring a lost one back. One in four pregnancies end in miscarriage or infant loss. This is not one in four women experience a loss, but one in four pregnancies end without a live baby joining the family earthside. For every woman you see with three children, it is likely that one of her babies is present in her heart, but absent from her home. Cold terminology like chemical pregnancy does little to hold the hands of mothers who should be holding their babies instead. At least you know you can get pregnant is not an appropriate response either. Neither is, well, it was your choice if a pregnancy was terminated for medical reasons, personal reasons or both. The loss of a child before, during or after birth is heartbreaking. There are mothers waking every day with this reality and the next and the one after that only to remember what has happened like some awful true life version of 50 first dates. To do this whilst caring for other children in your family, holding them in their grief simultaneously, is a weight I cannot begin to imagine. Then there are the mothers who are ill themselves, preparing their children for the eventuality of their own death as best they can, and the angels on earth left holding their children once she has gone. Sarah speaks of raising her niece, aged two, and nephew, aged four, after her sister died in mid-2020. I only ever set out to be their auntie, not their mum. Cass is their mum. I have my own son to remember in all of this too, and a baby on the way. Some days are so hard though. We look at pictures together. They cry, I cry. Then they go to bed and I cry some more. To raise the children of the one you grieve is another formidable task. In her book, Gifts from Grief, Rachel Pope writes, I know what real pain is. I know the darkness of death. I've had to sit and tell my four and six-year-old that their daddy is gone and won't ever be coming back. Rachel's husband died at age 47 of the same cancer that took her father, also at age 47. She explains that she had not come to terms with the death of her father or her brother from a car accident for that matter, until this compounded version of grief while mothering was thrust upon her. 
regardless of whether a mum's relationship with her mother or father was a good one or not, the loss of either or both of them during the early mothering years means there are many times grief may reappear or present itself anew. For some whose parents died before their babies arrived, the birth and bringing up of a child without them may lift the proverbial scab off a new layer of grief they were not aware existed. There is the grief of your personal loss of a parent, the one who you may now understand and appreciate all they did or didn't do for you in childhood in a way you couldn't previously comprehend. There is the grief of the arms that held you never holding your baby or for too short a time. There is the grief that they can't place their hand on your shoulder or tell you how proud they are of the work you are doing. There is the grief and anger that they are not there as a sounding board, an emotional backstop or a childcare support when you are at the end of your rope. There is the grief of the imagined future you held for a multi-generational family moments, be that picnics, when children are learning to ride bikes or when Father's Day and school grandparents' days roll around. My friend Bianca, whose mother died before she became a mother herself, describes it all too well. Death doesn't just take a loved one away, she says. It takes away all our future memories and dreams with them too. Mothers who are missing their own parents can find it isolating to be around conversations where difficult dynamics between mothers and older generations are brought up. Go easy on them, is Bianca's advice. For those whose parents are still alive but the relationship was strained before, or has become strained since having kids, there is potentially grief for you here too. There may be the perception that your baby is lacking some central family experience and difficulty in navigating boundaries around spending time with people whose interactions with your child you feel compelled to police. Pain may crop up in unexpected places. The time you feel pulled to go to your crying baby and you are calmly told by your parent or older sibling that you were left to cry for hours and it didn't do you any harm. If feelings of hurt like this are cropping up for you, a combination of talk therapy, like counselling or psychology, and timeline therapy, where you are supported to revisit the situation in your mind and give yourself the love and compassion you perceive was withheld from you, might be something worth exploring. I know many women who, once their babies arrived, felt incredibly pressured by the freshly minted grandparents they had anticipated would be of great help. Instead, the older generation seemed determined to undermine the new mother's choices around parenting practices at every turn. Some even took part in insulting, bullying or physically harming their grandchildren. In my mind, it is a privilege to be in the life of a child, not an automatic right. This rings true regardless of the blood ties or genetic relationship to them. If this is a source of unrest or sadness for you, I am here to offer you hope. Author Glennon Doyle tells us that becoming a disobedient daughter is a prerequisite to becoming a responsible mother. Her implication is that your parents have had their turn at child raising and they, in all likelihood, did their best with what they knew at the time. You are a different person in a different era who knows and has experienced different things. It is okay to do things differently. In her book, Untamed, Doyle recounts parenting her children with her wife and ex-husband as a united team. While this may not be a common child-raising configuration, it is worthwhile noting that separated and blended families are nothing new. As of 2018, it was estimated that 39% of US marriages ended in divorce. For Australian married couples who go on to divorce, the average length of time between wedding bells and separation is 8.5 years. Considering married couples often wait a few years before their first child arrives, this time frame seems alarmingly aligned with the peak time for mothers to experience postnatal depression, four years after the birth of their first child. When partnerships break down during pregnancy or parenthood, Mothers can experience a personal grief that is complicated by social pressures around what it means to be a good mother. The idea that the biological nuclear family is the ideal situation in which to raise a child sets up mothers 
experiencing separation to grieve not only the loss of their intimate relationship, but the loss of the perfect real estate ad family vision that they may have had for their children's lives as well. Charged with default responsibility for their child's nurturance and emotional well-being, these mothers must hold the hands of their children as they process big feelings around the changed family dynamics. There may be messy negotiations and court systems to manoeuvre during this major upheaval and days on end of co-regulation and mood management to do with children once they return from the other parent's care. If this isn't hard enough, mothers may then be expected to play happy families with an ex-partner on special occasions or supervised visits for the good of the children and mask any anger, sadness or grief that comes along with these public shows of what could have been. Indeed, the loss of an intimate relationship is as significant a cause for grief as any death and needs to be navigated with care. How is a mother to do this while wrestling with her own sense of loss, possible financial fragility and even guilt around the failure to live up to the ideal of the mythical perfect mother who martyrs herself in unsatisfactory relationships for the good of her children? The first typical books I read during my pregnancy was The Five Invitations, Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living Fully by Buddhist teacher and death walker Frank Ostaseski. Like the many hundreds of people he has held space for on the path to their final breaths, his words and the contemplative silence between them held space for me as I walked towards the precipice of... As my baby's arrival drew closer... I was undoubtedly excited to meet the person I knew only inside me as pressure and movements and never-ending hiccups. Yet, as one circulatory system, we were one in a way that I knew we could never again be once she began breathing for herself. Before I had even held my child in my arms, I had started what Mia Friedman calls the slowest breakup you've ever known. Although incredibly excited to meet her, I was grieving that she would, from this point onwards, only ever become more her and less us. Amanda's experience of grief during pregnancy was an altogether different one. At her 20-week scan, she was told by doctors that her baby would be born with a disability. What type, they didn't know, and the severity, they couldn't pinpoint either. How do you go about preparing for the birth of your beautiful creation whilst also grieving the imagined futures you had for your little family? Amanda describes the wait between discovery of disability and birth as agony. Learning of what mothers like Amanda go through makes me cringe retrospectively at the response I gave when people asked if I was having a boy or girl. I don't know and I don't mind, so long as it's healthy. As a child with disability ages, there may be grief from many angles, including the feeling of separateness between both the mother from other mothers and their child from other children. The social position of mother of a child with a disability is not one I inhabit at this point in my life. I can't pretend to know the complex ways this plays out in informal everyday experiences with other families or in relation to the broader medical, schooling and other systems we interact with. The title of Rachel Robertson and Christina Fernandez's co-authored chapter in Dangerous Ideas About Mothers, aptly named You Have No Fucking Idea, probably sums it up perfectly. In it, the two women write about their lived experience of mothering children who have disabilities. As her son prepares to finish school, Rachel writes of other mothers. They worry about their child staying out late or getting pregnant or driving drunk. I worry about my son having a meltdown on the bus, walking in front of a car, spending his life alone in his bedroom. Her words both linger and sting while giving me a solid hit of perspective when it comes to my personal worries. Those mothers who have not experienced losses in the ways mentioned previously are not immune to grief. Any loss, however big or benign, is something that needs to be acknowledged. Grief that the birth of your baby was not as you had planned is valid. Grief that you are returning home from the hospital while your baby remains in the neonatal intensive care unit is valid. Grief that you need to return to work for financial reasons before you and your baby are ready for it is valid. Grief that your career has been put on hold temporarily or permanently because you are the womb parent is valid. Grief if, through no choice of your own, you are not the womb parent is valid. 
Grief that your breastfeeding journey ended sooner than you were ready for is valid. Grief that you missed the closeness you had with your partner or older child before your new baby came along is valid. Grief that you had finally formed local connections with other mums then need to move is valid. Grief over a lost friendship, whether through death or life path diversion, is valid. Grief that your body feels totally foreign to you after pregnancy is valid. Grief over the death of a fur baby who was with you well before your kids arrived is valid. Grief related to past pain or even something you can't quite put your finger on is also a valid and very interesting source of unease that may affect your life in overt or unknown ways. There is nothing quite like the birth and raising of a child to bring up anything and everything that has previously hurt you. If there is deep-seated hurt around your needs not being met in some way when you were small, you may feel triggered when asked to meet those needs for your child, although it might not be obvious at first that this is why it is coming up. For women who have experienced sexual violence, Seemingly straightforward care tasks like nappy changes or breastfeeding may be very challenging. Using certain strategies at key trigger times can help, and professional support may be helpful as you trial and implement these. Perhaps it feels like a cloud of dissatisfaction or upset is hanging over you, but the label of grief seems irrelevant to your personal experience. In it didn't start with you, how inherited family trauma shapes who we are and how to end the cycle. Mark Wallen presents a case for how trauma does not always stop with the person who experienced it firsthand. Through DNA imprinting, he argues, trauma and the attached grief can be passed through generations. For women mothering on the margins of Western society, intergenerational trauma may shape their motherhood experience from many sides. It is not that long ago that enslaved women of colour in the USA were forced to care for and wet nurse their white master's babies while their own were removed, fell sick or starved. Aboriginal women and their babies in Australia were also subject to this heinous treatment well into the 20th century. Add the physical and cultural genocide of colonisation, the stolen generations and the ongoing trauma of systematic racism in state maternity, welfare and justice systems to the mix and it's not surprising that intergenerational grief continues to affect the motherhood experience of many black and aboriginal women to this day. This can be overwhelming to consider but if there is trauma and grief along any of your family lines or in your personal experience please take heart. Wallen argues that given the right support and tools it is possible to break the cycle of inherited family trauma and avoid passing grief to one's children in a single generation. If you are feeling low from reading this chapter, I apologise. I present this information not to depress you, but because grief is a part of life and it doesn't need to be swept under the rug any longer. Can you imagine the collective uplift that is possible for our world if mothers did their internal work and healed whatever was within their personal power to heal? If we supported one another by having conversations about what was weighing on us, allowing ourselves to open up, release our hurts and emerge anew, rather than each trying to prove just how fine we are. Now overlay the external work we can each do by casting our ballot papers to elect those willing to enact women's rights, social justice and reconciliation reforms, mobilising our buying power and sending our compassion out into the world. And there is cause for hope. While I am of the belief that fully feeling our grief can breed healing like nothing else, I am acutely aware that being in the depths of it really, really sucks. I am also aware that avoidance can be an acceptable, although far from optimal, coping mechanism, one that I admit to having used even during the writing of this book. I put off writing this chapter for a long time. While I gave my infant daughter all the TLC she needed, my parents were doing the same for my dying grandfather hundreds of kilometres away. In essence, I was making sure my daughter felt like the sun shone out her ass, while the man who had made me feel that way for 30 years slowly succumbed to motor neurone disease. 
For those mothering, whilst we grieve the demise of an elderly person, there is something poignant about witnessing the becoming of our children alongside the unbecoming and stripping away of labels and capacities that accompanies the dying process. As she learnt to climb, he lost his leg strength. As she learnt to match objects, his eyesight deteriorated. As she learnt to speak, so his speech failed. Like so many other mums separated from their nearest and dearest during 2020 due to coronavirus, border closures and other circumstances, I grieved that my parents were not seeing her leaps and bounds in daily development. I grieved that they saw her first birthday cake through FaceTime. I grieved that we didn't have our two primary childcare supports on hand. I felt guilty at the resentment I felt towards her when she needed more than I could provide and when I wanted to do the work I loved so much but didn't have the hours in the day nor the energy to do it. Then he died and I haven't stopped being busy long enough to let myself feel that emptiness to grieve that he is gone. For some of us, unfelt grief is what prods us to open another bottle of wine when we know we shouldn't. For me, it builds up as physical pressure inside, a constant lump in my throat, tightness in my stomach. I have difficulty sleeping and switching off, lowered immunity to illness, shortened fuse. Yet still, it is tempting to soldier on, putting on a brave face for my kid, only to wonder why the death of a Disney character in a movie weeks later sends me into floods of tears. I often wonder if mothers who have stayed at home caring for their kids get a double whammy of grief when their youngest starts school. Driving away from the school gate in an eerily silent car, the grief that has been suppressed under the frenetic pace of caring for young people has a chance to rear its ugly head. Although I'm nowhere near that phase of life yet, I have spoken with many mums who describe pangs of sadness when the realisation that this stage of their lives has passed hits home. While some mums will revel in the you-won't-know-yourself joy, others may wonder, what is my purpose now? And either count down the weeks to school holidays or begin searching for other meaningful ways to contribute to the broader world or family. Grief in motherhood is complex an unspoken undercurrent that weaves underneath high chairs and creeps out from closets when it gets quiet at night. We push it down underneath lists of things to do, but its discomfort stays just below the surface, waiting for its time to come up for air. Pushing it away seems to make it more potent, for each attempt at numbing brings a new trigger to a head. Perhaps instead of mindless scrolling, addictive substance or busyness itself, we could start mining our internal resources for gold. I have found asking myself the questions, why this and why now, to be helpful in starting this process. If you are grieving, I don't have solutions. To be honest, I don't even really have strategies that will be anything new to you. Friends, water, good food, fresh air, Feed on the grass, sleep, patience, speaking kindly to yourself and crisis support. Asking for and accepting help in all forms as often as possible. Knowing that processing your grief can help not only you but also show the little ones you love how it's done. And believing that somewhere in the darkness that pinprick of light will start to grow wider and brighter until the sun can warm you again, while knowing that it is still okay to cry about the source of your sadness whenever it comes back to say hello. Mama, if you are in that dark place, I see you. I hope with all my heart that your experience of loss will one day become a focal point in the beautiful tapestry of life experiences that have made you who you are. Until then, please accept this chapter as one big hug from me to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please remember to subscribe and leave a five-star review and share with anyone you feel may benefit from this content. 
If you'd like to continue the conversation, join me on social media at Anna Cusack Postpartum and head to my website www.annacusack.com.au to check out the ways we can work together. Please use the contact form on the website to inquire about having me run workshops with your client groups or book me for corporate speaking or professional development presentations. See you next episode. Thank you.